I think a lot of people take for granted the role of the male at the time of conception. Yeah. And their health is is hugely important. Their yeah. how their hormonal levels, or testosterone levels, and you know sperm motility, and how it's how it is at that time. Just because you you were able to conceive doesn't mean you were as a healthy sperm. You know right. that was involved in that process. And yeah. Welcome to Unraveling the Brain. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Matz, and today we are chatting with Dr. Carly Cameron, and we're going to talk about all things preventative. You know, you guys see in our videos all the time that, um, you know, we work with kids with developmental challenges and developmental delays and, you know, XYZ conditions, but what we're going to talk about today is things that we can implement way ahead of time to try to prevent it. Because, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And the more things that we can talk about today and you guys can understand today and learn, maybe even prior to conception, things that we can do during pregnancy, things that we can do to promote natural development and really in the first few years of life, things that we can do um, to help prevent developmental challenges in the first place as much as possible. That's what we're going to talk about today. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode and let's jump into it. What's up? I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much well, for having me. Well, thanks for jumping on. So tell everyone a little bit about yourself. You're going to be opening up um, in Kansas City and you're kind of your passions. Yeah. Well, I'm super passionate about that what I call P to 3 range. So preconception through three years old. There's so much that we can do in that time. There's basically like four big windows that I look at where we can make a huge impact for not just like pregnancy and birth in those first three years, but just way down the line for these kids' lives um, for future neurodevelopment. Yeah. Like like you already mentioned, preconception. That's the first one. Yep. Um, the stretch of their pregnancy, how that goes and looks. Birth itself is huge. There's so many different aspects of when it happens, where it happens, how, all of yep. that. Yep. And then that, that first three years when you have just a ton of neurodevelopment. Yeah. Yeah. And we're the goal of today is just to more or less chat about, here's all the things to keep in mind as maybe even prior to conception, what you're, you know, what you're doing. Um, and then during pregnancy, what you can be doing. Uh, and then, you know, cause we see a lot of these kids that are struggling and you know, a lot of times they don't get picked up till four or five, six, but there's always indicators much earlier than that. So we'll talk about yeah. those today. So let's start off with like preconception, like what, you know, what would be maybe some things you would say to a, uh, someone that's like, Hey, I want to get pregnant in the next year. You know, I have some ideas too, but the, uh, what are some, maybe some big things for pe- soon to be our potential parents to start thinking about prior to conception? Sure. Great question. Well, I'm probably the, the place that my mind goes is the same as yours. Microbiome health yep. is like something I would like to check right away. Right. Can I see where their omega-3 status is? Yep. Um, their diet, obviously, you yep. know, is a huge deal. Um, toxic burden, like what are they putting in their food? How are they preparing it? Um, what kind of chemicals are around? Yeah. There's a... I mean, BPA, that's a crazy study. It's still in preprint. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, uh, let's see, your camp and Matthew Campen's the, the the main author on it. And so it hasn't been peer reviewed, but wild study I just wrote over the weekend where they looked at, at 24 of these brains. They had tissue samples. They used like gas chromatography and mass spec to find out how much plastic was in these brain samples. Yeah. And in 24 of them, they found 0.5% plastic by weight. That's crazy. And that one thing to go off of that, there's something that's super interesting is, you know, plastics produce BPA. PPA dysregulates the thyroid. And one of the biggest, um, ri- uh, one of the uh, bigger risk factor when you look at these big meta-analysis for developmental delays, interestingly enough, is thyroid autoimmunity. And we, really? and we know over and over again that you gut, different gut stuff plays into that, obviously, which we can jump into. But that BPA can cross track with their thyroid, which is super interesting. Um, How that plays in the role with the baby. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And those, those autoimmune, yeah, those autoimmune <laughs> antibodies, they can cross track with fetal brain tissue and they can affect fetal brain tissue as it develops. So super interesting. Crazy. And and also in the same study, they had 12 of the brains, they had um, like been diagnosed with or found in autopsy dementia and they had up to 5% plastic by weight. And That's so wild. crazy how much it's increased too. And yeah, yeah. I and mean, we, I know personally, like we, all of our, everything we store everything in is in glass. Everything we drink out of is glass, like personally at home. And that's been a big thing that we've been trying to change just for the health of our own family, you know, over the last few years here and, and, you know, how we're cooking our food and what type of, you know, not having liners in our, um, 
I don't remember the exact name of them, but in our cookware, not having oh yeah, like non stick stuff, puff, yeah, yeah, like all that stainless steel. Do you guys like stainless steel? Or do you do yeah? The... We do stainless steel, and then um, we use cast iron for some stuff too. So my husband's a big cast iron guy. He likes the cast iron. Yeah, the uh, and from a risk factor standpoint, it's really you know like for when you look at all of these risk factors for developmental delays, and if. You can go on my website, LimitlessFoundation.co. You can get access for free to all my research articles. There's tons of them in there. I mean, literally, there, I think there's close to 1,500 research articles. But there's a bunch on um, the uh, risk factors for developing uh, developmental delays later in life. And from a parent's perspective, prior to that is, you know, that really the health of the, the parents is huge. Yeah. And, you know, age plays into it too, but the health of the parent in the um, – the you know is if a parent is overweight that plays into it and because they have metabolic issues and blood sugar issues but um, let's talk about some of those things and yeah and why we want to look at those and and things that we can check before you ever become pregnant to make sure that um, things are healthy even I think a lot of people take for granted the role of the male at the time of conception yeah and their health is is hugely important their yep. how their hormonal levels or testosterone levels and you know, sperm motility and how it's how it is at that time. Just because you you were able to conceive doesn't mean you were as a healthy sperm. You know, right. that was involved in that process. And yep. there's um so some interesting theories that even the the health of the male at the time of conception plays kind of a larger role in morning sickness, even in the woman's health at that time of conception. Really? Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. That is, and you know, when you look at the male population now in comparison to um. I'd have to relook up some stuff on this, but the the um, sperm count in males has gone down dramatically in a short period of time here as well. And same with testosterone levels have gone down tremendously. So, you know, not exercising enough, not eating a healthy diet that promotes, you know, normal function there. So that's it, hugely important in the research. A large body of research supports that with big meta-analysis too. Absolutely. Um, there's, I'm kind of a nerd, so I, I like to, pull up random papers, but this this crazy paper, I haven't read it for a long time, but it was like 1992. They looked at polyester as a spermicide, using it for contraception. And it's a, uh, it was interesting, like after like maybe a hundred and like three or four, four or five months, maybe like 140 days into the study, they had zero sperm being produced. They were really having them wear it um, kind of as underwear, right? Yeah. And then six months after the study concluded, they did it for a year it that's when the sperm levels started finally coming back. Really? Yeah. Oh man, I'm gonna have to check all my clothes. <laughs> I sent I sent this study. I send these things that I find like to my husband, yeah. you know, throughout the day and stuff. I don't know if he reads them. And I'm this totally is, gonna go home and check all my underwear <laughs> after this. A, a few years ago, I sent this study to him, and he maybe gave me like an eye emoji or something, like looking at it or whatever. And he got home and like just went. Like just right past me, I had this Mark Marshall's bag, and he does not. I go to Marshall's, he doesn't go to Marshall's, <laughs> like full of stuff, and like goes into the bedroom. And I'm like, that's weird. Like, I'm walking into like no greet, you know, like yeah. hello. And then he comes, like, I hear him shuffling around, leaves the bedroom, goes back outside, and like, I'm like, okay, I'm looking out there, he's throwing something away. I go in the bedroom, and he has taken all of his like Under Armour, like, yeah. Like, all of them, and they're gone. And now he's like got all these Marshalls cotton underwear. <laughs> oh man, I'm totally gonna have to go look at, and look. I guess at all he does. Stuff. Yeah, I guess he does read some stuff I send him. Yeah, <laughs> that's super funny. Um, okay, let's talk about gut health. Let's talk about diet. What if a mom's saying? Let your I shouldn't say just say moms. Two potential parents want to conceive. What are some big dietary? Let's just give a high level. Here's some some good dietary stuff we can do. Here's some good micro stuff we can do for our microbiome. Yeah, well, candida's man, it's it's everywhere. everywhere. There's yeah. so many people who have um, underlying yeast issues that they don't yeah. know about. Yep. Um, so if you can get a test, kind of see where you're at, or just look for some soft signs of that, I think it's really important. Um, well, um, soft signs. So, uh, like for instance, uh, if your baby, if, so I see this for new mothers a lot, or moms who have previous pregnancies. They'll say, oh, man, my baby had cradle cap so bad, you know, yep. or, oh, she used to get these really bad diaper rashes that were really, you know, bright red, yep. you know, stuff like that. You know, if they had yeast with a previous pregnancy, you know, they probably haven't gotten it taken care of unless they knew about it. Yeah. And so some of those things you can look for. Um, and 
if you part of that yeast imbalance, I mean, it's if it's there trying to get rid of it, it's hard to do unless you can just completely cut carbs out of your diet. Yeah, you can you just, watch your diet. Man. You just got to get at least Stop um, feeding it. Yeah, because that's what it lives off of, right? Yep. You know, is that sugar. And so I think educating a lot of parents that um, they can cut out like excess sugar. I think that's great. But during that time when you're trying to really get your gut, you know, back healthy again, it's any kind of sugar. So it's the yep. breads, the pastas, yep. you know, the, even rice, you know, trying to get all those carbohydrates down. Yep. I really like keto diets. I love carnivore. My cousin's a big carnivore guy. He's yeah. uh, pretty much healed his Lyme's disease. It was debilitating for yep. years and years just by, you know, getting his gut health, you know, yeah. back together, which was, was through carnivore. Yeah. And that's how I got over my mold toxicity was going basically carnivore slash ketogenic and, um, and being really careful about, you know, obviously I probably had a, a, a yeast overgrowth in conjunction with that too, but the, uh, it's, it's a really good solution for a lot of chronic autoimmune issues, a lot of chronic disorders and stuff like that too. So yeah, the, one uh, component of it I feel like is, is that you're, at least you're eliminating too all these other offenders. So not yeah. only you're getting rid of carbs, but people have, um, just amenities against all kinds of like gluten and yeah. then you have, um, dairy issues and some people have it, all kinds of things that are cross-reacting with other areas of their body that yeah. if they can eliminate it it's basically elimination diet yeah most people aren't allergic to meat no. you know yeah and so, you don't see that almost ever come up on a food sensitivity test <laughs> yeah so it's a really safe way to just get your body totally clean and then start bringing things back in as you tolerate them yeah yeah for sure and you know and then when you look at like just uh, uh, those carb sources and you then you have you know, pretty much they're all processed things and then on top of that in those processed grains you're going to have higher levels of mycotoxins you're going to have higher levels of pesticides you're going to have higher levels of herbicides you're going to have you know all these other chemicals that just part of our normal agricultural landscape gets added to it that is going to disrupt your your gut i mean they're trying to disrupt your gut they're going to disrupt your immune system they're going to disrupt they're going to create inflammation and neural inflammation and and trigger abnormal immune system function. So by eliminating that, you're, you're taking out a lot of those sources of impurities in our, our natural diet. Absolutely. And it's and also for your, you know, as you go through pregnancy, I mean, a lot of that stuff's crossing the placenta that we we know. 100%. You know? And then on part of it's getting trapped by it. I mean, it's the things that research has shown has ended up, you know, in that placenta. It's wild. Yeah, th- 300 and some neurotoxins or in carcinogens yeah yeah like crazy stuff yeah i know i remember reading a study it was a long time ago it was when i was in chiropractic school still and i was reading looking at a study of what's in like been found in u.s population women's placentas like that is unreal yeah it's so it's crazy and like you said so much of that is our you know our packaging you see you know even heavy metal stuff coming from yep. all those packaged foods and the fresher the food you can get, just eliminating ultra processed food in general, no matter what yeah. diet you're on. If you just start with that, just yeah. like if this is ultra processed, I don't want it for me or even yeah. my kids. That's a yeah. great place to start. Exactly. Um, any other, let's say, supp- supplementation for gut or things like that? Or, or maybe um, we could even just talk about uh, um, maybe a good lab to s- if someone's, you know, maybe they're not going to see someone like us, but they could recommend a. Uh, a lab they could ask their provider about. Sure. Um, For, well, it might be more of a functional medicine lab, but I really like some micronutrient labs like Vibrant and some great ones just to see where their health status is for all the essential vitamins right before they get pregnant. I think it's really good. And then being able to supplement off of that. I think most people, you know, I mean, I think it's like 80% of the population is deficient in magnesium. I mean, there's some easy ones, right? Like you're probably going to be deficient in magnesium, you know, B vitamins are a very big role unless you're eating a lot of, you know, beef liver on a regular basis. Um, yeah. I I like the whole food concentrates, especially for wellness care. Yeah. Um, I use standard process that's it's organic, it's whole food. And so it's like basically it is beef liver. Yeah. And so if we're not eating beef liver that week, then I might take more of it and I give it to my son to, you know, chew up some of that too. And, yeah. Um, if they are, if it's a winter time... And even in the summer nowadays, let's be honest, like a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D. Yeah, not getting outside. I mean, it's it's a, an epidemic, honestly. And if you 
can do something like a cod liver oil. Then you'll get yeah. that vitamin D with it. You have a little bit of fat. Yeah. Help that absorption of the vitamin D. Um, I think something else that I've been seeing a lot more is, you know, I can get excited about kind of giving people some recommendations on these nutritional products, but then do they even have the stomach acid and the digestive enzyme to break it down? To break it down. Yeah. Which is absorb it. It is crazy when you run, um, you run a lot of labs, you end up figuring out like they, their stomach acid is so low. They're like, a lot of times they're not even able to break down proteins. Like they're like, I'll run labs and like, it'll show they're deficient in protein. Like we eat protein like every day. I'm like, okay, well, you're just obviously not breaking it down appropriately. So, which again, it's that those highly processed foods over and over, they disrupt that normal acid production. So, and when you start eating more meat, you start producing more stomach acid, uh, which is kind of wild. And something that I have patients do, I mean, you can run labs to find out if they have low stomach acid. Yep. And then if they if they want to do a quick test at home, it's called a belt chest. If you use that and you can just milk, uh, you can just mix some um, sodium bicarbonate, but baking soda, baking soda and water and just have them take that and drink it. And you can look it up online. It's like two minutes. You should you should belch within a couple of minutes of that hitting your the acid of your stomach, the HCL. Oh, really? And then if you don't, then it's way too alkaline and it's not able to huh. yeah, to mix together. Interesting. Know. Learn something new every day, don't yeah. you? Um, okay. So now we're at the point where, you know, we're talking about gut, fixing, you know, those things prior to conception. Um, let's talk about some stuff during pregnancy. Okay, well. This is not my forte, but I, I've never been pregnant, so. <laughs> Fair enough. I love pregnancy. I love one of those moms. Um, you're Webster certified, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So can I just run down kind of what we look for? Yeah. So we talk about the three P's of progression that you're familiar with. And from a chiropractic perspective, I'm looking at just empowering the mom through those those three P's of progression to help that pregnancy um, go more smoothly. And so the first P is your power. And that just is talking about the nervous system. It's what you do with your functional neurology all the time. Yep. Just making sure that brain is communicating well with the body because that's what's coordinated in the birth process. Yep. And then the second P is your passageway. And um, and what's your technique? And then I went on and did the, it's a perinatal certification. We learn a lot of really awesome um, checks and techniques and um, in order to assess the bones, ligaments, and the muscles of the pelvis. And so by optimizing that environment of the pelvis, then we give baby plenty of room to move around, um, to do those kicks. You know, that's that, yep. that ATNR, you know, we yeah. believe is responsible for all those little kicks that mom yep. feels and all those primitive reflexes. And that's their, their, the first part where their, their brain is growing. Then that right. environment, and we need room for them to go. We don't want any intrauterine constraint. And then also that's helping their sensory experience by having room to move around and turn and, and all those things. And yeah. so we, we look at those ligaments and make sure that, you know, maybe they have a tight psoas on one side and that uterus isn't able, it's, it's a, the baby's not able to turn to that direction, or maybe that's tilting the uterus some. And, and actually you do want a little bit, you want to tilt to the right of the uterus, a little bit is okay. That helps that corkscrew of the baby during contractions to get turning, you know, as yeah. the contractions increase. And so all those things we can check and really optimize for mom. Yeah. And then the third P is the passenger, so the baby. And we want to make sure that because that environment is improved and because we've optimized the neurology, then now baby can do what they know to do best yeah. and have that amazing inborn innate intelligence they know exactly what to do and how to get out. And they take a, a very um, an awesome uh, and predictable pattern, you know, to yeah. get out, you know, when things go right. Yep. And it's real. I, I think it's really interesting. Like a lot of the primitive reflexes that we have to work on with kids, like they develop, a majority of them develop inside the womb with the first responsibilities to get them to roll out of the womb. And, yeah. you know, when a kid has a lot of these, or we have a lot of these challenges with birth a lot of times it's because they're not developing those reflexes inside the womb. And that's, uh, again, if they can't move efficiently, they're not going to develop these reflexes. If they, um, and then, you know, obviously toxic stress on top of that. And all these different stressors can play into that total maturation of their, their nervous system inside the womb. But the, uh, um, but that I, I agree 100% that biomechanics of the pelvis being able to, that, you know, the child being able to move inside the womb and develop that movement 
that just makes that birth process so much easier, number one. But then it reinforces those reflexes that come out to start that normal development of those reflexes developing. Absolutely. And especially if they're, you know, by doing those things, we're increasing the chance of natural birth. Yeah. And then by having a natural birth, again, you're activating all those, re- those reflexes to be able to leave. In fact, uh, whenever we were first learning about reflexes and things, I remember thinking it's so weird that babies initially, you know, have this plantar dis- response where they push off of things because yeah. you would think it'd be to help them walk, but it goes away in the first like 12 weeks yep. birth side. And so, but the reason they have it then, it's not for anything about walking later. It's because they're actually the last motion after their head is um, exited the birth canal, they actually press off the uterus to help, you know, deliver yeah. themselves at the very end. And, and so all of these serve an amazing purpose, both inside the womb and then of course to develop the cortex outside as they yeah. keep getting elicited. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And, and even just like, you know, we talk about the, the spinal gallant, how it, when it basically stimulates it, creates a contraction. And then you have their head starts to turn and this arm starts to straighten, and this one starts to bend and it starts to create that whole mechanism. It's super cool. It, once you learn those reflex, you're like, wow, that, that makes a lot of sense why that exact process happens. Um, and then baby's out. So now baby's out. What can we do to reinforce normal neurological development in those first hours, days, months, you know, to uh, through that first year, because sad reality is a lot of these kids are not developing those reflex appropriately in that first year. So what are some things we can do to reinforce that? Yeah, absolutely. So I usually tell moms the first, well, I guess this, this, this takes us back just a little bit, but my recommendation for them when it comes to birth, first thing is to go talk to a midwife, even if yep. they want a hospital birth, Go and speak to a midwife, especially one that does attend home births. Um, there is really amazing study. It's, um, it's oh, not Jansen. That's another great one. Jansen et al. It's a 2009 study. They, they looked at home births specifically, um, and they found just, I mean, increased patient satisfaction, less birth interventions, less obstetric interventions of all kinds. Yeah. Um, and then the Sandall study, it's a 2015 study. It was like 17,000 women. And in that, they found not only less, you know, interventions of all kinds, you know, forceps delivery, vacuum extraction, um, less analgesia. They found uh, less amniotomy, episiotomy. I mean, all those things are really good. Less um, infant death, both before and after 24 weeks. And then I think the biggest thing I saw was that 24% less preterm birth. That's birth before 37 weeks. Yeah. And so encouraging moms, um, you, you hear moms like, oh, I just can't wait, you know, to get this baby out of there, you know, that kind of thing. But encouraging moms that like they're in a good place, yep. you know, right now and this development happens at their own time, at their, that placental fetal rhythm, you know, that they, they develop with mom. It's always a little bit different rate. And so encouraging them to keep the baby there until they're, they're ready. Yeah. And it's not that that can't be done at a hospital. I mean, it, especially, I mean, interventions when they're necessary you know, they're life-saving. Yeah. Um, but when they're not, they can be really detrimental. Yeah, and for sure. um, if you're trying to have a natural birth, you know, without any interventions, it's just really hard to do an environment that's specifically designed to intervene. Yeah. And, and having someone that's has done it over and over and over and over again without intervention. And, you know, like that's huge. I mean, with we, we had midwives for our first one and then and with this one as well that we're going to be having. And and it's the, it's just so much different experience, you know, like in the first one we had to go, we ended up having to go to the hospital because we had some, some, again, some interventions that needed to happen because things weren't happening, you know, the way they're supposed to that at that time. But the, uh, this one we're, you know, working for at home, but either in both ways in, or on both sides, we still had a midwife that helped coach us through a lot of these things and understanding like all the different positions and all the different, you know, like it's really not ideal to be on your back to give birth. Like, you know, and, and the, uh, all the different positions and strategies and stretching and things like that that you can do prior to, to make sure baby's in a good position. And uh, it, that knowledge base is just something you just don't get if you don't have a midwife. Absolutely. And it also, if, so say that that doesn't go that way, you know, there's still things you can do, yeah. um, and be proactive about, you know, getting to a, a chiropractor, a pediatric chiropractor, you know, as soon as they're born, yep. you know, that kind of thing. Being really on the ball when it comes to their reflexes, their milestones, if they're preterm. Yeah. 
Um, oh, yeah, if sure. it's a cesarean, um, something that there's a really cool documentary I recommend for parents called Microbirth. And you can get it online. It's just a, it's maybe like five, ten dollars, that kind of thing. But it's a great um, look at just the epigenome and how genes get switched on and off during birth. So, you know, a good amount of stress is important for turning on certain genes. The microbiome itself is hugely important um, for turning on those genes. And so, say you have a baby that's born cesarean. Yep. Now they're not getting mom's great, you know, vaginal flora. Yeah. They're just left to get whatever commensal bacteria are hanging out yeah. in the hospital, which exactly. usually, you know, aren't good ones. Right. And so the ba- bacteria in the skin rather than, you know, like as they're coming through that. Exactly. And something that um, some midwives do, some, some OBs will do is you can actually do something called vaginal seeding and they can take swabs and they can swab the baby's mouth right after they're born to help um, get that their microbiome established more appropriately. Yeah. And so there's all these things you can do, you know, if like in your case, sometimes, yeah. like you said, you know, you have to intervene and we want those interventions to happen when they need to happen. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So yeah. now baby's out. Most important things in the first hour, the first day um, that we can do to reinforce just normal development and appropriate feeding and appropriate um, just development. Let's start there. Yeah. Um, skin to skin, yeah. you know, delayed cord kind of thing, all, all of those things, you know, make sure the baby's getting, you know, plenty of uh, that awesome cord blood that's yeah. there. Get, getting all the blood they're supposed to have. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. brain needs a lot of blood, you know. Sure does. And uh, breastfeeding, you know, is huge. Um, that's something else that you saw increased along uh, with midwife continuity of care. Yeah. Midwife led a lot of increased um, breastfeeding duration. Yep. And then establishment, which is really important. The first the first two weeks are really critical for establishing mom's milk supply later on. Um, but then it's the first six weeks where the neurology of breastfeeding is really laid down. And so in that time while the baby is figuring that out, it's it's really important to make sure that, you know, there's not tongue tie. You know, where is their latch at? Yep. You know, do they have cervical dysfunction that's affecting these things? Because we don't want them practicing bad habits and developing, you know, things that are going to be become more permanent over time. Great. Right. I mean, how how many little infants do you see that, like, it's crazy. They can turn their head all the way, you know, normal range of motion is actually past their shoulder as an infant. And they can turn one direction. They can't at all the other direction. It's, I mean, this is my own son. He When he was born, it was kind of a, a little more traumatic birth. And the he literally couldn't tip his head to the right. He couldn't turn his head at all to the right. All the range of motion was normal to the left. And and the uh, like if I wouldn't have known what to look for at that point, like, it would just have been a completely different developmental trajectory. Um, and this is something you see all the time when you see these kids, especially in the first couple of days, is a lot of times they, they can't turn their head. And yeah. to be able to feed on both sides, they be able, be able to turn their head. And to start developing all of their primitive reflex appropriately, they have to be able to turn their head. So that's the range for everything. And yeah. in fact, you know, we think about the cervical curve even being developed more from extension, but we've actually found because of the facet angles, it's actually rotation. Yeah that helps them develop that curve that is important for vagal tone and for all kinds of things health-wise. Um, but yeah, that's huge. And if you weren't there, you know, knowing how to assess and adjust and make sure mm-hmm. he could turn his head full range of motion, that not only would have impacted, you know, breastfeeding, but especially those primary reflex development. Yeah. In fact, it would have affected crawling, ar- or army crawling, crawling, motor milestones. I mean, all of that stuff gets affected when, when you, because we have something, it's, it's called the, the cephalocaudal law. We develop from our bottom down and that starts with we start moving our head and neck and then we start activating our core and our truncal muscles and we start rolling and we start activating our hips and our you know it kind of works its way down but if you can't move your head they just won't develop that those motor skills and exactly that's what prevents a lot of developmental challenges is getting those motor systems developed in the first year i think that's so crucial for parents to understand like you said that head down development and checking from the beginning, because they can check that. And I think it's funny, especially first-time parents, they're almost scared to even check that. They are. like you know? uh, Oh, yeah, I can't turn. I mean, like, I don't, they don't want to even turn the baby's head a little bit, you yeah. know. And so being able to just go ahead and check it and like, make sure, you know, don't force their head. But, yeah. But just make sure that they can turn their head, like you said, like 110 degrees, you know, yeah. either side. Yep. And if it's not, that's so that's the first check I tell them to do is... And it is, should be smooth. Like, it shouldn't be like, start, stop, start, stop. It should just be nice. Like, correct. take the head. It should, it should feel like there's no resistance effortless. at all. Yeah, effortless. Yeah. And if it's not, that's when you need to get it re- corrected as early as possible. Because a lot of times it's like one or two adjustments and it's perfectly fine. And having to do a few simple exercises to reinforce it. It can be very simple. It is. If they So if they can't turn their head... 
Um, or even if they can turn their head. So that's what I, I'll check for that, right? And then I check to make sure that each individual segment is contributing yeah. to that head turn. Yep. And something else that's important to look for um, is just their cranial bone movement. Yep. You know, is there's eight bones in the cream. All of them need to move with inspiration and expiration. And I have a lot of, well, a lot of parents don't even realize babies can be adjusted, but even more don't realize that, you know, the skull can be adjusted. And yeah, it's very light, just like all babies' adjustments are light. You know, the pressure you put on your eyeball, that yeah. kind of thing. And, but we're checking for that that motion. It's so important. Whenever you're, the baby is born, that first year of life, their brain can increase by three times. Yep. And so if it if you have restrictions in that cranial bone motion, as that brain grows, that creates distortion patterns in the skull, yep. which you think, oh, it's, you know, so it's, you know, it's cosmetic, but really it's not. I mean, it changes neurology. That brain's going to grow in, into the area of least resistance. Yep. And so we want good full range of motion um, through all of that. And then also there's, um, even if birth goes well, there's a, an interesting study. It's a, by osteopaths in England, um, osteopaths like DOs, you yeah. know, they do some manipulations. Um, uh, we call it adjustments. They do manipulations a little bit different, but they looked at a hundred infants and they found somatic dysfunction in 99 of them. Yeah. And that's just areas of the spine that weren't moving through their full range of motion, increasing like tension and um, tight muscles, soreness, whatever. And we, I call that subluxation in the chiropractic world. And yep. 95% of those were condylar. And so that's compression of that occiput on the top bone of the neck, the atlas. And the, thing about that is not only do you have issues there because, I mean, you have the superior sympathetic ganglion, you know, that goes yeah. to innervate muscles of the tongue for breastfeeding and latch. And then also that can affect things like a posterior tongue tie. Yeah. Um, you also have like 94% or so had cervical dysfunction and you, you literally have fascia that goes from these TDPs on your neck. Yep, up transverse through your, processes. Yeah, yep. the transverse processes up and through your neck and then attached to your tongue. Yep. And so if you have areas of here that aren't working well, I mean, even from a physical standpoint, it's changing the tone of the fascia. Yep. Also for, you know, tongue ties and that kind of thing. Um, and then in this same study, these were all natural births. Yeah. And so it's supposedly without any issues or interventions, and yet kids still had issues. And so it's important to get those checked out and, I mean, you have this condylar dysfunction that something that struck me with that is that, um, you know, your occiput, its union with the temporal bone is what forms that jugular foramen for glossopharyngeal, yep. vagus, spinal accessory nerves. And you you could have a whole podcast just yep. on the vagus. Oh, yeah, and, for sure. You know, it's like how important it is. And so making sure that their cranial bone motion is normalized. My son, my six-month-old, Charles Gabriel, he was born with um, a posterior tongue tie. Mm -hmm. And also he had an internal temporal uh, subluxation, so it was just stuck a little bit of internal rotation. So as you breathe, all these other bones are kind of moving well, but not so much that one as well as occiput, yeah. what we call it, an extension. Yep. And simply by working on that, his upper neck, you know, very light adjustments, his tongue tie was gone in two weeks. Just restoring normal function. Just restoring range of motion and normal function of the, of the brain. So that way it can coordinate everything better. And yeah, yeah simple fix. Nice, nice. Um, to go off of that as well as like, now we can start talking about, okay, well, primitive reflexes should be developing. And it, and I have a, if you go to limitlessfoundation.co, I have a small course, like it's really, it's, it's maybe like an hour long. It talks about all the different motor milestones that should happen in the first year of life. And if a kid isn't hitting, I'm like, what's some simple stuff you can do? Maybe this reflex isn't developing. Here's how you can reinforce that, stuff like that for that first year. Um, because like for, for me as Yes, this, the whole developmental process or the birth process is super, super important for starting this process. But what, where I kind of come in is if these things aren't being hit and it, we end up seeing because maybe their milestones aren't being hit in these first years, that's when they end up coming to me um, is where I end up seeing them. But we're hoping that we prevent that and we get we get to them before that, that point ever happens. But um, I think talking about here's some things that, you know, when these motor milestones are kind of supposed to happen and if they're, they've missed them um, or they're not hitting them on time, maybe what that can mean. And we'll just have a fluid conversation around that. Yeah. So first of all, I've actually taken that course from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was awesome. I love it. I still refer back to it and, and yeah. have patients, you know, try and encourage them to take it um, because that starting out, like I think their first video actually talks about cervical range of motion. Yep. And that's really where it all should start. Yep, exactly. Um, from there, I think tummy time, man, 
if I recommended one exercise for parents, goodness, like get their kid on the tummy, get their kid on their tummy, play more. with them on the ground, yeah, get carry them on their stomach, you know, as much as possible. Yep. Even so, starting out that first twenty-eight days, I mean, and even the first few days when you're the baby's fall fresh, just get in a recliner. Yeah. Have them lay on their belly in the recliner so you can make it, you know, a little bit easier for them. But start encouraging, you know, that head, head lift. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Keeping them out of a car seat as much as possible when they, you know. We, when you're carrying them, when you have to carry them around, carrying them on you, yes. if you're actually in the vestibular system, they're not just sitting in one spot with no head movement. Like they're getting constant stimulation. It hundred percent. It drives me nuts when I see parents. They literally they have strollers now that the car seat's attached to. Yeah, so kids are up and right in yeah because the they're stuck in a car seat, you know, driving everywhere. And they get them out and they're stuck in the car seat, still going in the yep. stores, and that's yeah. so awful for them. Like you said, it's. That vestibular activation is important because that's it's all tied together, right? Yep. I mean, you talk about that, you know, with your parents and in your, your course, it's one homologous column. So yeah. if they activate the muscles of their neck. There's actually 44 pairs of muscles that get activated when when they're in extension in tummy time. Yep, you're activating deep postural muscles in the trunk and the back. But then when you do that, when you activate the, the neck, you're activating the vestibular system, their balance, yep. and so their eyes, and their eyes they're tracking all, systems. They're all c- perfectly connected, and that lack of stim. I mean. And if you think about it simply, like, you can start developing their spinal musculature, their eyes, just by simply moving them, like, and consistently moving them. And every chance that you get or every chance you don't take to do that and they're in a car seat, that's one last chance that child has to start developing appropriately. And especially wearing them on you. I mean, like, yes, obviously it's to be a car seat in the car, but it's like, leave your car seat in the car. Exactly. Where it's supposed to be and put them on you in some form, shape or form. Maybe that's holding them. Maybe it's wrapping them in. I don't know what those things are called, but yeah, the the wraps, the wraps. Whatever, yeah, 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 yeah. And just making sure that they are on you, moving constantly is huge. Absolutely, and even if it's, um, you know, like sometimes it's nice for parents. Like they get into a certain habit. Um, if you can establish some habitual practices, like. Okay, first thing in the morning with my baby, what is it going to look like? Yep. Maybe it's putting on a record or, you know, a music or a YouTube video and dancing a little bit. Yep. You know, dancing with your baby, establishing rhythm patterns, all that's so important. You know, just getting them moving for that little bit. Or if you say that, you know, maybe after dinner I'm going to take my baby for a walk, but ditch the stroller, you yep. know, and just carry him around and, and let him, you know, touch trees and grass and experience yep. things, you know, from, from very early. That can be so beneficial. Yep. And, you only have so much time with them. I mean, it goes by so quick. And especially yeah. their wake hours are so short in that first couple of months yeah. that you you got to make good use of that that time when they're awake. Yeah. Yeah. And putting them on their belly on the floor and like something that is hard for a lot of new parents, I think, is like, oh, he's crying. I have to pick him up. Oh, she's crying. I have to pick her up. Like, but instead, like getting down there, letting them cry that out a little bit and, you know, actually experiencing that and having them, you know, They'll start lifting their head. They'll start using their body like it's okay for an infant to cry. They're going to cry for 7,000 different reasons, but not always thinking, oh, they're on their belly. They're crying. They don't like it. I got to pick them up. Yeah. Look for another way to make it more comfortable. Or sometimes they're just bored there. Like, you yeah. know, try to, like you say, get down there a level and make it fun for them. Yeah. And yeah, experience it. Mm-hmm. Um, those are all great things because they're things that you never get told. Like when you leave, you know, you leave the hospital, you leave whatever, you don't get told those things, but they're super, super important. Um, you know, then we want to reinforce, we want to make sure they're, they're rolling. You know, they should be starting to roll, um, you know, honestly, pretty early on, those four, four or five months, they should be starting to, you know, do quite a bit of rolling, rolling back to front, front to back, both sides. Um, and they should be hitting that pretty consistently. And if they're not, a lot of times, like an asymmetrical tonic neck reflex isn't developing, a spinal gallant reflex isn't developing, a symmetrical tonic neck reflex isn't integrating as efficiently as they should. Um, so making sure we're hitting some of those motor milestones and, and maybe you can give some insight on you know a few different things that you can do to reinforce that. Yeah. So that three to four months, you want to start seeing that, that, that back to front, you know, rolling mm-hmm. over from back to front and it's a little later from front to back. Yep. Um, and something else, you know, if it, if they, you do say like, wow, they're actually rolling from their front to back sooner than that. You know, it could be that they, sh- they're, there's so and so much extension, yeah, you know, posture, extensor tone. Yeah, and extensor tone. Thank you. That 
they just kind of topple over. So it's different than a roll. You know, yeah. that's more of a log roll where they fall over. And yeah. so and that's something else that you just want to get checked out if you yep. start seeing that kind of rolling. But it'll actually become, it's going to happen in the opposite order. So they'll start, you know, on their backs, rolling to their bellies, uh, three to four month range. And then a little bit later, that that four to five months, then you want to start seeing them roll from their, their tummies back to their backs. Yep. And if they're uncomfortable during those times or during tummy time itself, you know, another reason to get them checked out for, you know, a pediatric chiropractor or yeah. someone, they might have issues with extension and, and where the, it's uncomfortable for them yeah. to turn their head, just like a, they'll sure. lift their head up, like it's uncomfortable for them to turn their head to their sides. Yep. And like you said, when you're doing that tummy time, you're activating those deep postural muscles um, that's setting the stage for that rolling. And just getting down there and encouraging that and helping them roll, um, you can actually, I'm not sure I could I talk you through it that. here, yeah. explain it here, but, you know, when they're, when they're on their um, on their tummy, and if you get next to them, you can actually reach through and grab their opposite arm and just help guide them a little bit to that roll, yep. initiating that roll, and, and just probably yep. Google it. You know, look it on YouTube yeah. to say how to help my baby roll and, and yep. encouraging pull, that movement. Pull that arm through and then turn their head in the same direction and it, it's it, it'll initiate a reflex that cause them to start to roll. So Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And then in making sure they're doing that consistently over and over again. If if they're doing it to one side but they're not doing it to the other side, we'll help them practice. Like it was just like anything. They just sometimes they just need a little bit of help to trigger some of those reflexes then they learn and they Start doing it both ways because you do want to see both ways. You don't want to see them just go in one direction all the time because now you're only activating one aspect of your vestibular system instead of both sides, you know, appropriately. Um, then we should get into army crawling. Um, you know, I usually say right around that five to seven month mark, we should start seeing some some decent army crawling, five, maybe even five, six months. Um, we should start, then we should start seeing some good cross crawling right around six, seven months. I'm getting up on their hands and knees and starting to develop some of that, maybe even into eight, eight months. Um, so it can be a little bit later. You may have given a few different recommendations on time frame, And then we should see them walking really right around their first birthday. Now that's, that's right in line with what I, you know, go for. Sometimes, you know, your your army crawl can start ipsilateral and then move contralateral. I'm totally fine with that when I see that in defense. I think that's a part of normal development, but as long as it's still on the right schedule and yeah. the right time and then they get to that cross crawl pattern, you know, you'll see that, that little bounce, you know, right around eight months where they're on their hands and knees. They yep. can get there finally, um, but then they maybe can't progress because of that STNR. And, yep. and so, um, and then at one, it's so, it's um, discouraging to see that, milestone of walking pushed back to 18 yeah, months because sure. um i just had a conversation with the parent recently and it was uh well i you know my peterson says that we're barely behind at this point because the baby's 20 months old and it's like yeah you're now you're kind of barely behind but i mean they've lost so much time you yeah know, on this they, and they just lost eight months that they could have been developing more appropriately correct i mean it, yeah 20 months my kid was jumping down three stairs like yeah you know like that's that's a big deal it is a big deal and if we can just keep parents aware of that and, and what you said before i mean as far as being able to see um you know normal development bilaterally i mean that's probably one of the best recommendations that someone gave me when i was pregnant with my first baby was like hey just make sure that you look at your baby like a 360 human being and i remember thinking that was kind of a weird advice but then you know, as I had them, it's like, it's so true. Just like, okay, are they always riding in this car seat on this side of the car, always looking out this window, the same yeah. direction? You know, are they always put in this part of the room? You know, when they're, yep. they be, when they're starting to roll over, is it always to one direction? Yeah. And just checking for those patterns and stuff and, yeah. and helping them encourage that. Are they only using their right foot to go up steps? You know, yep. that kind of thing and helping them just encourage the other side. Yeah. Um, something that it's kind of random that I, I read recently was that at three, you know, when kids learn to really jump and spin that they'll typically like to spin in a certain direction yeah and it'll be easier for them and so it's like to check that you know when they turn three and then help them on, on developing both the other direction yeah and i thought well, it's really that it'd be normal it'd be bilateral and yeah. i had my son spin like wow like it was so obvious one was a lot easier than the other yeah yeah it is that's super interesting um yeah and i think talking about so these motor milestones like when they're not hitting those appropriately it's simply just, it's a sign that these systems, especially primitive reflexes, are not developing efficiently or appropriately and at the right timing and hitting all those mechanisms. And 
and they need to be, they should be. And that's going to promote further development of their balance centers, of their eye tracking centers, of all these other things. And the reason why it's important is because it's so easy to correct at 18 months, like so easy versus I don't want to see them at eight years old. And now there's been seven years of abnormal compensations and development when you could have simply just seen someone for four, five, six visits, corrected these things, given some simple exercises, you do at home for a few weeks, and now we don't have to worry about it versus eight years later when they're struggling with handwriting issues or reading issues or behavioral dysregulation or whatever it may be in relation to whatever reflex profiles they had. But they can be corrected so much easier in that first year. And if you're, if someone is telling you, oh, your kid isn't walking till 18 months, that's perfectly normal. It's not. Like, it's simple. It is not. It is not consistent with normal developmental sequences that we've gone off of for hundreds of years. And now they went and somehow changed these, rule, these, these appropriate milestones to match our current population. But our current population has an epidemic of neurodevelopmental dis- delays. And I know I wouldn't want to base my kids' developmental milestones off of what, what's the right words? What what is common? Because it's not normal. Common and normal are two different things. It's common that kids are delayed, but that's because we have an epidemic of kids that are delayed because of all of these environmental things that are going on. Um, versus, we can help them develop normally by addressing these things earlier on. Yeah, and it's not just about like, oh, I want my baby to have a strong neck, you know, or I want my baby to walk at 12 months, you know, it's like you said, it's about future cognition. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about how by developing these reflexes at appropriate times about them walking, you know, how that plays in a role with future learning, future emotional control, cognition, behavior, I mean, the higher cortex. Yeah, for sure. You know, when we, when we look at development like this, when we start seeing an infant raising their head and starting to turn their neck, that's their, their midline cerebellum developing. The midline cerebellum has a nucleus in there called a vestigial nucleus. Uh, you don't have to remember that. The uh, uh, But that nucleus is responsible for helping coordinate our limbic system and our vagal system to help calm ourselves. So it plays a lot in emotional regulation. And when you look at a history of a kid that has a lot of behavioral dysregulations, what parents will typically tell you in many cases is that they never army crawled at all. They didn't they didn't crawl in their tummy. And that's them developing that in a more complex way. And then their uh, intermediate areas develop and they get up on their hands and knees and they you start activating their shoulders and their hips. Then their lateral areas develop and they start standing and using their hands a lot more. And But what why that's important is that lateral area coordinates our speech centers on the opposite side. So that's why you don't see a kid start to talk until after they walk or at least talk well. Like we'll have kids in here that you know, maybe they're three and a half years old and they just started to talk. Well, they don't, or sorry, they, they, they just started to walk. They won't talk before that. Then all of a sudden their speech explodes because their lateral cerebellum is getting activated. It's crossing over and starting to activate their higher cortex at a much higher rate. That's known as our cerebrocerebellum because it's our cerebellum and our cerebrum, that connection, our cerebellum coordinates our higher cortex on the opposite side. So then once that starts to develop, our speech starts to develop and then our our attentional networks start to develop. And these things are all super foundational for just that higher cortex to develop and that cognition to develop. That's that's how we develop our brain. We develop our brain through movement. And the earlier we can reinforce appropriate development, you know, in in that appropriate time frame, the better cognitive development we get and the better speech development we get and the better ability we get to learn. Um, And that's why it's important. It's you know, the, yeah. the motor milestone is just one thing. Like if a kid's late to hit it, you know, because maybe these things weren't known when they're eight months old, 10 months old, and they're late to hit it, you know, you know what you know now, but you need to make sure they work through all of those developmental sequences because that's literally their brain developing in the appropriate sequence. So if they miss crawling, even if they're 10 years old, they need to go back and crawl. <laughs> like they have to redevelop that to some extent. Um, and it makes a massive difference. So... I mean, yeah. something so key that you said there is just that it's movement that develops a brain. Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely right. It's movement that develops a brain. And from a chiropractic perspective, we look at, you know, we're looking at movement at a very small level, like each joint themselves. Are they all yeah. moving and contributing to that full range of motion? And that's important for the global movement that they produce, you know, restoring range of motion yeah. so that they can elicit these reflexes and develop their higher brain. But then also so that you can normalize that sensory input in to the yeah. brain, right? Your cerebellum has 
40 times the axons coming into it than going out, you know, all yeah. that input. And so when you have an area of the of the spine that's not moving through its full range of motion, you're going to be increasing both in like aberrant or bad proprioceptive information to the brain, yep. as well as nociceptive information. And now it's not always, you know, perceived by the brain, you know, by the limbic system as pain, but it's still, it's adding, you know, what almost like static Yeah. now that this brain has to sort through. And so think about it as um, like the last straw on the camel's back. You know, maybe a, a brain, you know, that's really healthy and it's doing well, it doesn't have a lot of toxic burden. It can kind of sort through and it's fine and it can compensate. Yep. But look at a child that maybe has autoimmunity against its own Purkinje cells. Yeah. You know, and it's in the cerebellum. Those are cells in the cerebellum. Yeah. You know, where now you have um, an issue with maybe it can't tone down uh, all this incoming stimulus because it's dealing with the static from, you know, bad perceptive information because these joints aren't moving well. It's got inflammation in these Purkinje systems. And now these kids, they can't handle loud noises. They can't yeah. handle being touched. Yep. You know, maybe there's issues um, in the basal ganglia, you know, because of they have these dairy allergies and all these other things going on. Yeah. And now you have static that's affecting the basal ganglia. It's, they're not running efficiently. Yep. And so you, you're having a lot of maybe some some ticks or, yeah. you know, something like that. And so yeah. it's not that, you know, from my chiropractic perspective, I, I just want to make sure that we, we restore motion first. Because yeah. even though that's not necessarily you know, the reason why you know, this has happened or that has happened, it's oftentimes it's stress that stress that's the last straw that, that you know, brings yep. the camel's back. Well, in, in something also important to go off of that is, is these individual movements of these joints, they are like, they're like kind of, they're literally like little windmills for our brain. They produce what are called gamma oscillations that fire up through our midline cerebellum and those fire into our frontal cortex to keep our frontal cortex active. So like kids that can't focus, a lot of times, like they will have dysfunctions that they're not getting that input through their spine appropriately, or maybe they don't have good enough muscle tone to get that input through their their spinal column appropriately, and then therefore they're not activating their frontal lobe so they can actually focus and regulate and shut and use their frontal lobe to shut down a lot of these reflexes and use their frontal lobes to calm down their basal ganglia and and you know calm down ticks and things like that. And what you'll see with all these kids that have these developmental challenges is they have typically a pretty low muscle tone in their core. They don't have good balance. They don't have good eye tracking skills. And those are all midline cerebellum. And a lot of times you'll make an adjustment and make a massive change to their balance centers or make a massive change to how their eyes track because you simply just help to reorganize information coming into their cerebellum. Now it can do its job more appropriately or you yeah. take that stress off. Take the so, stress off of the nervous system so it yeah. can function efficiently. That's, yep, exactly. That's how I, my dad was a chiropractor. And uh, so I kind of got to, you know, adjust baby dolls from an early age and that kind of thing. And and that's what I fell in love with first, honestly, was the philosophy of chiropractic, which is just at at its core, in my perspective, is that we were given this God-given innate intelligence to heal and tend towards wellness. And so when you can take the stress off the nervous system, it is designed to heal. It does what it should do. It does what it's supposed to do. And it's it's so opposite of, you know, the very mechanistic view of traditional medicine that that without the intervention of like pharmaceuticals, our bodies are constantly decaying. And so yeah. without and and just that turning that on its head and saying, actually, yeah, our bodies are meant to do these they're things. They're meant to do like, this. They've been designed for hundreds and thousands of millions of years to perform the function that God intended it to. And if we can just get out of the way, stop screwing up our entire environment putting them in environments where their body can't do that because of too much stress and correcting some of these underlying mechanisms, it's amazing what can happen. What the body can really do is is truly amazing. What are some of the turnarounds you've seen? I mean, when you've done that, when you've gotten the primitive is gone, you've gotten that stress off their nervous system, maybe you've gotten them, you know, you probably take a lot of patients off of gluten and those kind of things. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Can you talk about some of those changes? Like how quickly do you see things sometimes? Oh, man. I mean, you'll see changes in... I mean, you'll see changes fast. You'll see changes in days. You'll see changes in weeks. I mean, just it's, I mean, kids that don't walk, walk. Kids that don't speak, speak. You know, kids that can't learn can start to learn. Kids that, you know, like it's, their bodies are meant to do these things. And yes, there's some, obviously some severe cases where, or kids where they have so much stress and they have so much injury to their system where it can only heal to a certain extent, right? There's limitations of matter. There, you know, chiropractic philosophy is, you know, there there might be some limitations there based off of their their traumas. But uh, if you can remove those, the, the three T's as much as possible, re, you know, 
the the toxic stress, the 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 traumas, the you know, and I can actually consider like an autoimmunity or a concussion that trauma obviously trauma to the nervous system and those thoughts, you know, like it's when you can use your your lifestyle, you know, medicine approaches to improve those scenarios and then you can work on correcting the underlying dysfunctions. It's crazy what changes. I mean, we're designed to heal. People just heal, you know, when you can get those barriers out of the way for them or help them understand that. That's so true. That's what, you know, those three T's, that thoughts. It's interesting. The, um, there's a Erica Komisar who's written this book. It's called Being There. And she's a psychoanalyst. And so, you know, I think it's similar to what you do in that instead of like with like cognitive behavioral therapy, you're, you're doing stuff right now to approve, you know, their issues right now. But from her perspective, she's looking back at that, you know, the first, you know, how did birth go and how did the first few months of life go and how does that impact, you know, what their challenges are now. And from her research, she has seen huge correlations with, you know, just kids who are have a very present mom and dad, who the mom especially who's there, you know, that amygdala isn't really even supposed to come online that first six months where they're in that primitive, you know, crying, like, helpless mode, you yeah. know, because mom should always be there kind of yeah. helping uh, to calm them back down. And so by um, intervening, you know, early and, and even from a thought perspective, I mean, she's looking at it from as a psychoanalyst, but it's so similar to what you're talking about there with the three T's. I mean, that can be applied to any discipline. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, the, you know, those obviously those big studies of uh, of lack of that interaction in was it Romania or Russia or wherever that was where, you know, all those kids that oh, they yeah. didn't get moved, they didn't get yeah. that loving connection, how they had massive cognitive issues. And, yeah. And, you know, Left in the crib, stuff. not moving around. Yeah. Part of that's the, the movement thing you talked about. Yeah. And, but yeah, all like impacting social, yeah. all three of those chemically, I'm sure yeah. they had a ton of stress. Yeah. Emotionally sure. and physically. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything else we should talk about for you? This is about an hour. Wow, that's gone by fast. It has. Um, maybe we'll do another one. Let's, we'll, we'll plan on doing a second one. I think there's a lot of information for a lot of parents. Um, you know, and re-list, parents, re-listen to this. Like, you know, go back. These are all things that, like, they've been shown over and over and over again. It isn't just two crazy chiropractors talking about this stuff. Like, there's large meta-analysis reinforcing all this stuff. And it's it's well-known research done by fantastic PhD researchers that, reinforce all of these things that we're talking about to help raise healthy kids. And, you know, we, we want to make sure we get this information out there so that we can make sure we, the next generation is better off than this generation. Um, you know, and the next, the next people that are having families can, you know, raise healthy families, which is really hard to do in our current environment. So I hope this helps you guys out a ton. Any last words? No, thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Yeah. Where can they find you? They can find me at uh, doccarly.com or at my Facebook page, Carly Cameron Chiropractic. And then on Instagram, I'm Dr. Carly Cameron. Awesome. See you guys later. Have an awesome day.